Hi. <laughs> Hello. So this is Cheryl with Arthritis Life, and today I have Claire with me. Can you tell the audience a little about yourself and your yeah. diagnosis story? Sure. So my name is Claire. I am 34 years old, and I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis at 23. All right. And how I came to my diagnosis was similar to, I think, the story of many in that it was uh, a journey <laughs> and um, one that uh, a diagnosis was not um, arrived at quickly or easily. Right, yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, at the time when I was 23, I had um, just returned from six months living in Madagascar. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so that's not something you hear every day. Mm -hmm. um, and when, when I came back, um, I was having some gastrointestinal issues, <laughs> went to see a doctor, not uncommon for um, living abroad. Uh, I mm -hmm. was uh, diagnosed with Giardia and given a strong course of antibiotics, right. um, which I dutifully took, uh, and immediately following, I started to experience some swelling in my left knee um, that quickly grew quite significant, um, mm. nearly uh, the size of a cantaloupe. My left knee became enormously large, oh um, hot, red. Um, impossible to move. Um, it was wow. very shocking. Um, and so I don't know if you've ever heard that um, adage about like when you hear hoofbeats, yeah. think horses, not zebras. Yeah. Um, but when you just come back from Madagascar, people are thinking communicable exotic disease. Mm -hmm. um, rheumatoid arthritis does not run in my family, though mm -hmm. all the women in my family have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Oh, okay. So my mother, my sister, my aunt, my grandmother. Um, and that's also an autoimmune disease. Which is also an oh, autoimmune wow. disease, correct. And, um, but, but no joint issues. So, oh, okay. um, and I was only being affected in that one joint initially. Wow. And so I had joint fluid aspirated and cultured for every sort of strange exotic disease yeah. I could <laughs> and surely must have because of, of where I had just been. Right. Um, which, of course, all came back negative. Um, then the swelling went away and it, it sort of passed for a few months where I wasn't pursuing it as anything because the, the uh, acute situation had dissipated and there were no additional symptoms. Um, but then I started to experience some pain and stiffness in my hands. Both so, hands. Okay. Uh, yeah. And went to my GP um, because, again, I had no inkling that this was an autoimmune condition. Right. And um, went several times um, trying to repeat and describe what it was that I was feeling and um, did not have a good experience. Did mm -hmm. not feel like I was being listened to. It wasn't until I think the third or fourth time that I had gone back to my mm -hmm. GP um, that she even touched my hands to examine them. <laughs> wow. um, at which point I broke down in tears because I was um, so grateful that she was actually sort of taking my pain seriously right. because I no longer had a knee the size of the cantaloupe. It was no longer um, visible, but I was, I was experiencing significant pain and stiffness. And at that point, I was finally referred to uh, a rheumatologist. And had a very hard time being believed. That yes. was the hardest part. Being some, the, I'm guessing the primary care, maybe doctor, is the one. And did you ever go back to her and tell her about no. your so that, That's a passion of mine, and I, I hope that part of what I can do at some point is start a campaign where we go back pure, purely for education. Mm. Because if everyone's not, if we're all not telling the people that didn't believe us what actually was true, they're not learning either, right? Yeah. So, but yeah, I don't even have, it was like 15 years ago for me, so I don't even know some of their names anymore. I'm like blocked them out of my memory. Yeah. But I was just curious because I, I do think that they need to know if they're telling people that, oh, you're just stressed or, oh, you need to relax. And you actually did have 
a legitimate diagnosis. Then, yeah. You know? No, I I would kind of love that. I don't know yeah. that I'd be able to filter Ooh, let's out film my it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I'd be able to filter out my expletives. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'd have mm. a few choice words, but yeah. no, that that's a great point. And, and yeah, I do hope that maybe in watching videos like this, that some primary care providers might think a little it's bit a hard, about their, you know, it's a hard job. Like I actually talked to a pediatrician for my son and he said he worked in emergency care for like 20 years and now he's doing prim primary care as a pediatrician. He said, emergency is way easier than primary care. And I was like, oh, that's interesting because the acuity is mm. way worse than emergency. But he said, you know, in primary care, when something walks in, it could be anything. Whereas an emergency, they've already filtered through. They know they're having an emergency, right? So mm. I do feel compassion for the primary care providers. I think that they have a really hard job. It's kind of like, you know, in Dr. House, where it could be lupus, it could be lupus, it could be lupus. Like every single patient, it could be lupus. Every, <laughs> But at the same time, that shouldn't excuse them from, you know, if they have blind spots that should be, they should be addressed. And obviously, there's a lot of research that shows women in particular are often not believed um, at the same rate that men are. Their symptoms aren't taken as seriously. And so I, I got in to see the rheumatologist. He took uh, a cursory glance at my uh, blood work, had me take off my shoes and socks, uh, grabbed my feet. I screamed and hit the ceiling basically oh in, in pain. And he, you know, that was it. He said, so you have rheumatoid arthritis. We're going to get you on, you know, da, 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 da. And, and so began the formal journey. Wow. Um, and, how, and how long did it take between when you arrived home from Madagascar and when you got the definitive diagnosis of RA? Do you remember? Six, six months, I think it oh, okay. was. Okay. Yeah. So not too long from yeah. when I've heard from a lot of stories, but it was... Because I had come home and hadn't yet started back in school again, mm. it was all I was doing. I had all the time in the world to get yeah, to the yeah. right diagnosis. And so it felt like a lot longer because no, the mean, quantity of doctor's appointments in that short period of time was a lot. Did, <laughs> was you, a lot. did you delay going back to school because of it? A little bit, okay. yeah. Oh, um, wow. There were other factors. Um, I had just moved, again, across country, across, right. or across um, the continents and then across country. So I... I was landing in a new city for other reasons. So okay. um, it wasn't all just because of uh, the medical difficulties I was experiencing, but certainly, yeah, it contributed. And so I had all the time to deal with it mm -hmm. and it still wasn't getting results. Oh. I will say I have a lot of feelings about the diagnosis process and how that yes. all went even getting to the end of the road where I had you know the formal diagnosis that I could you know right. carry with me um, there was nothing shared with me at that time about really what that meant and how it was a chronic illness and that yeah. these medicines they were prescribing were going to be with me forever you know or at least yes. for the foreseeable yes. future and these are the things that are going to be different about your life that there was none of that um, so I had to process and come to all of that realization mm -hmm. on my own. And um, that was emotionally very difficult. The, the, yeah. Aside from all the you know physical changes then that were right. coming from my symptoms, which then became bilateral and, and started to move through more of my joints. Um, right. But you know, all of that coupled with the emotional journey of going um, through the processing of getting a chronic uh, illness diagnosis right. was, whole separate thing. And how long do you think it took you to understand that it was a chronic illness? Because I, I think it was between five and ten years that it, it actually hit me. I, I didn't really get it at first, but would you say it took you a long, it sounded like it took a little while, maybe not five yeah. years. Yeah, no, <laughs> it took a long me. time and I, I'm still processing for yeah. sure. Like yeah. there, there are yeah. things that um, you know, still, still come, you know, across your path that you realize that are different now because of, of, of your diagnosis. Um, but some of it hit me pretty, pretty immediately mm -hmm. because, um, the life I had been leading prior to that, doing field work in a remote rainforest of Madagascar right, right. was no longer in the cards. It had been my, um, if not lifelong dream, a dream for many years 
to um, after finishing my bachelor's degree, I wanted to go into the Peace Corps and work in international development oh and mm -hmm. and live abroad in these um, remote sites. Mm -hmm. um, and I very quickly discovered because I went immediately, almost immediately, to investigate is rheumatoid arthritis is a exclusion uh, a condition that excludes you from service in the Peace Corps. Wow! Because I mean. Because of the uh, health concerns about being immunocompromised, right, the right. necessity of having refrigerated medica medications in most cases, so it's it's understandable. But that was wow. that was immediate and pretty intense having that sort of rug pulled out from underneath me. Mm -hmm.